evening. You're watching SG News. I'm Hugh Riches. In the headlines tonight, concerns over prisoner safety in Humberside police custody. The NSPCC warns of parental substance misuse across our region and commemorating a Hull philanthropist. And later in tonight's programme, I'll be talking to Charlotte Bowen on preserving memories of the Humber Bridge. And before that, Councillor Jane Hilden King on Ride to Work Week in North East Lincolnshire. A report by Her Majesty's Inspectorate for Constabulary has raised concerns over prisoner safety in Humberside Police custody. A number of potential ligature points, points which could bear a noose, have been found in custody suites and the review also found issues with children and vulnerable adults being appropriately supervised. Assistant Chief Constable Scott Young said the issues identified by the report are being addressed through staff training. The inspection was carried out last October. More than a 1,000 referrals have been made to local authorities about potential substance misuse in Yorkshire and the Humber. The charity, the NSPCC, says people have contacted them about parents drinking too much alcohol in the presence of children. 10,207 calls were made nationally in 2016 to 17, with more than 8,000 of these serious enough for the police and local authorities to be notified. The charity says those misusing drugs or alcohol should seek help. A Hull philanthropist who gave land to the city of Hull has been commemorated with a blue plug today. Zachariah Pearson's donation led to the creation of Pearson Park in 1860. He was born in East Hull, became a successful ship owner and was twice mayor of the city. Zachariah Pearson was my great-great-grandfather and he donated this park to the people of Hull. It was the first time ordinary people ever had a space of their own. They couldn't afford to pay to get into the zoological or the botanical gardens and Zachariah Pearson provided them with a really nice piece of land where they could get outside, have recreation, breathe fresh air because all the mills particularly were polluting the air horrendously and they could rest and play games. He did such a lot for Hull. He provided Hull with clean water when he was the mayor. He built a town hall. He initiated the West Dock scheme from the, which turned into the Albert Dock. He did so much that has gone unrecognised because after he went bankrupt it wiped the slate clean and people only remembered the bad thing that happened and he got a bad reputation. So he's been quite airbrushed out of history of Hull on the whole and the fact that we've now got this fantastic plaque means that at least he's been recognised at last for being the good chap that he was with the interests of Hull at his heart. We see great accolades to other famous people from Hull and I'm really pleased now that Zachariah has at last been recognised in the uh, in, in the same echelons really because he did a lot for Hull. Lincolnshire police have released this CCTV image of a man they'd like to speak to after an elderly man was attacked in Lincoln. The incident was on the 12th of February on Woodfield Avenue when the victim was robbed and had his bag of shopping stolen. The suspect attacked the victim twice. Anyone who can help with inquiries is asked to call 101. New figures from Safer Roads Humber show that more than 600 drivers were detected using a handheld mobile phone last year. It's been a year since the penalty for the offence was changed from £100 fine to £200 and from three to six points on the driving licence. 658 drivers were caught in 2017, a drop compared to 1,200 motorists caught in 2016. The chair of the City of Hull and Humber Environment Forum says flood defence work in a congested area of Hull is essential to protect thousands of homes and businesses from flooding. The Environment Agency has invested more than £36 million in a flood defence project on a section of Bankside from Clough Road to Air Street that will take three months to continue to complete. Road closures have caused severe delays since the project started last month, but Adam Fowler says the work is vital. A decision has had to be made that some of the river defence works next to Bankside now have to be re-sheet piled and, and heightened as well to stop the water coming over the top and that's led to the closure of Bankside but I think the people of Hull, a lot of people in Hull have said why have you closed it? Well you've got to close it if you don't upgrade the river defence works and the flood defence works with the massive scheme throughout the Humber area 
this area is going to be underwater more often than not, and that's what's got to happen. And that it's calculation has been made. That, that the calculation has been made. And the yep. frequency. Yep. They would not be spending 35 million plus of taxpayers' money. I've been involved in some of it, not the bank side issue, but I do consultation for Hull and East Riding Councils and the Environment Agency. And particularly going back to 2007 and the flash floods in Hull as well, and we've had floods in places like South Ferriby, of course, and the South Bank. If we don't do something, the water will rise over and we, and we will be flooded. There is no question about that. A new exhibition in Hull highlights the city's links with Italy. The exhibition, called Italian Connections, explores how Italian migrants came to Hull at the start of the 20th century in search of work. One such migrant was Osvaldo Toffolo, who came to London to pursue work in mosaic and terrazzo laying. His great-grandson, Carl, says he hopes the exhibition will be an education for the people of Hull. Well, it's, it's showcasing um, Italians who um, emigrated from Italy, obviously from Italy over to Hull um, over the centuries. Um, I, I, can't, I can't speak much beyond the late 1800s, um, but, sorry, before the late 1800s, but, but my grandfather came over from Fana in Italy, uh, which is probably, uh, it's north of Venice, I'm not sure f how far, about 60 miles maybe, something like that, in the foothills of the Austrian Alps. But they ended up in London, uh, all three of them were working in London uh, from the early 1900s. Um, my grandfather, Osvaldo, um, it was sent from London by the company they were working for up to Hull. Um, I th we suspect he met the love of his life here and therefore didn't want to go back, or she didn't want to go back, so they ended up staying in Hull. Um, and he worked for another company for a few years but then started his own company up, uh, O'Toffolo and Sun Limited. Um, the Sun being my uh, one of his six children, the youngest of whom was Bernard, who was my grandfather. Um, so that was started up in 1916. It's, it's a lesson, I think, which uh, I'm not pushing that too strongly, but it's a lesson that um, immigrants are um, a, a great benefit to any, any area or any country, because they bring in skills that don't exist in the country in the first place or the town in the first place. It's Ride to Work Week next week, encouraging as many people as possible to cycle to their work. Councillor Jane Hilden King is the portfolio holder for health and well-being at North East Lincolnshire Council, and she joins me now to tell me more. Jane, welcome. Thank you very much for coming in. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Did you uh, come here by car? No, I came on my bike. Well, what is Ride to Work Week? Is it a national project or is it... It's is a it national project, but uh, obviously what we do here in North East Lincolnshire is try to encourage as many people to leave the cars at home and to spend a week cycling into town. And what are you doing to try to encourage that? Oh, we're doing everything we can through promotions and because of this Ride to Week, you get the opportunity to sign on, to go online and you actually get chances of winning prizes as well. So it's, it's, you know, it's so to the, encourage people. The more you cycle, the more you can get sort of surprises. Yes, there's prizes. Cycling these yes, prizes. It is, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, this is mainly, and your, your responsibility is health. This is yes. mainly a, a health programme, isn't it? Yes, how, it is. How, yeah. how healthy is cycling? Cycling, I think, is really important. And I don't think people grasp the importance of having a healthy lifestyle. And in North East Lincolnshire, what we're trying to do is to encourage more people to be healthy by walking, cycling, and taking up some sort of physical activity. Uh, at the end of the day, it make them a better person, and it obviously it's their well-being that's so important to us. Is it dangerous on the roads of Grimsby? I won't say Grimsby is the safest place, but um, in the last three years, uh, we've done an awful lot of uh, work regarding cycling safety. Uh, we do lots of things in the schools. Uh, we have got cycle paths. In the past, some of our paths were very good, not very well designed. But the work we're doing now with NGR partners uh, to try and promote more cycling. And we've got quite a big project coming up very soon because we want to be able to cycle to Wimmingham and people to cycle into Grimsby. So we're working on a project at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's important to emphasise that pretty much anyone can do this. It's not, you know, yes. unless it, it's, it's, if you your, your age or abilities yes. or nimbleness are yes. all quite uh, over, yes. easily overcomable and bicycling yes. is easy for anybody. You, I know that you, you managed to put um, a pair of crutches on your bike. Yes, I do. I've been disabled from a very small young age. Uh, I've never liked cycling.
nothing stopped me. Uh, I think it's whether it's psychological, I'm not sure. But I think my body's got used to riding a bike and I continue to do so. But because of my disability, uh, I have to use crutches now. And I've got panniers, so I fold them down and cycle on to work and then get them out. So. There's yes. another aspect yeah. as well as health, mm. of course, and this is mm. available to everybody. Uh, the, there's an environmental impact of cycling because if you're not burning carbon and, and throwing foul, yes. foul smoke yes. into the atmosphere all the time, then you're doing some good. I think this has been one of my aims for many years because I used to be chair of environments, so I've got a huge uh, you know, respect for people uh, riding cars, but it's difficult to tell them to try and leave the cars at home. And when you consider Grimsby, North East Lincolnshire, we're a flat town and uh, easy accessible, it's difficult to promote it to get people to get out of the cars and to cycle. And uh, I'd love to see some of our roads uh, become clearer. I think we've got too many cars on a road, which is a worry for me. Uh, health-wise regarding the environment and smoke. Uh, I just wish we could encourage more people to ride to work. And of course, um, are you sure that this is the right time of year for that with this weather? I do, oh, come on, I've, I've cycled on my life. I still go out to work, whether it's January, whether it's July. Jane, so, well, well done to you. Yeah, so you I cycle much. everywhere. But, Th stay stay yeah. safe. Thank Join you. me after the break. Jack will bring us a roundup of the latest sports news and how you can become a yarn bomber in Barrow. Welcome back. You're watching SG News. Still to come tonight, Jack brings us a roundup of all the latest sporting action, and I'll be talking to Charlotte Bowen about the history of the Humber Bridge. Barrow is calling out for yarn bombers. An appeal has gone out for anyone who can knit, crochet, or make pom poms that can be peppered around the town during June's Wheelbarrow Weekend. Anne Bolton from the Better Barrow Community Project says people's creativity will make the marketplace look more attractive. The idea is that. Uh... We'll get people to knit or crochet or even just make pom-poms to decorate the uh, marketplace during the wheelbarrow weekend. As you can see, we've got plenty of places that we can decorate. We also would like, if, if possible, a group of people to come forward and decorate, say, the big tree behind me in the marketplace. Uh, we've got somewhere, we've got the WI doing the other big tree, but we also need the phone box um, decorating if possible. So we hope to have a really good show for the Wheelbarrow Weekend on June the 2nd and 3rd. We had nearly 90 decorated wheelbarrows around the village last year. Uh, we had 16 open gardens, which was good, um, which was most we've ever had. It must be a record for a village like this because even big villages don't get that many. But, uh, but it's mainly the wheelbarrows. People come up with some wonderful ideas and uh, you know they decorate them and we have judges and we have prize winners and we have a people's prize winner it is a good weekend and this this yarn bombing will just add to it Louth Run for Life will be signing up runners on Saturday. Now in its 13th year, there'll be three events, an under 12s one kilometre, a women's five kilometre and a men's 5k race. Last year's event raised £46,000. Organisers hope to break the £50,000 barrier this year to help fund research into all types of cancer for Cancer Research UK. The sign-up event runs from 8.30am until 2pm in Louth Market, the race is on the 24th of June. A project exploring the hidden histories of the Humber Bridge has been launched. Charlotte Bowen from the Culture House, who will be running the project, joins me now to tell me all. Charlotte, welcome. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming in. Thank you for having me. <laughs> where, where and when will this, be, this history be available? Where and when? Right, well, it's a long process. Right. So it's an 18-month project um, running from now until next June. So during that time, um, we will be going out into the communities um, that surround the bridge. So that's North East Links, North Links, um, Hull and East Riding, um, and looking at what the social history is of the bridge. And what I mean by that is um, finding out what stories people have got, what impact the bridge has had on them, any stories that engineers have got from working on the bridge. So this is a research um, project, is it? Right? It's very much a research project that will then result in an exhibition that will tour to those areas. And there'll also be photography, um, audio and a documentary film. 
And it's a really key project for the region and for the Humber Bridge because this information has not been captured before in this way, um, people's stories and experiences. So it's going to be really key and really interesting to see what comes of it. It is, apart from anything else, it's a very beautiful bridge. It is, it? It's yeah. It's wonderfully beautiful. And for a long time, it was the longest bridge in the world. Right, yeah. I think people in Japan and Sweden have superseded <laughs> it since then. Uh, That's right. A suspension bridge, anyway. Um, but what, what has been its social impact then? What, what, how has it changed this region? Um, well, I think we can sort of take a guess at that without delving too much. So there's obviously the connectivity that it's enabled. So um, commuting, um, leisure time, you know, visiting Yorkshire or Lincolnshire, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot there that the bridge will have opened up for people. Um, but I think there's there's going to be a lot of stories there that we don't know about, especially from the time of the build and then leading up to when it opened. Um, and we want people to tell us about the impact it's had on them and what difference it's made. It has, of course, been uh, very important in promoting the deep love and affection between the South Bank and the North Bank of the Humber. <laughs> That's correct. I mean, there's always been this strange relationship, as it were, um, and the bridge has potentially combated some of that. Um, but, yeah, it, it's an odd one. And I think that that will come out in the project as well. Has has that Has it connected both sides of the bank? Or has it not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was built, I mean, when was it built? I think it was finished and opened in the... 1981. Early yeah. 1980s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the motivation behind building it in the first place? Well, the campaign, I believe, started um, in the 1800s. So it goes way back. The Victorians um, were nothing if not ambitious as far as engineering is concerned. That's it. And I believe, as far as I know, that the, there were those reasons. It was the connectivity, economic drivers, things like that. Um, and bridges were being built across other um, estuaries, rivers. Um, I hear sometimes an argument that it was built as a sort of a sop to the constituents of Barbara Castle. To yeah, I keep think her, keep her her seat safer. There's that. There is that. But um, if you think the campaign um, was going on for such a long time, um, and I think it it kind of came to the point where you know it, it was either going to be done or it wasn't, and, and to do it was obviously. The, po the positive move. Well, it, it, as soon as it opened, of yeah. course, it created that connectivity. How, yeah. how, has, how has its uh, usage, as it were, changed since those days? I think at first, as far as I know, um, because by the time it was built, um, the motor infrastructure was, was quite um, healthy um, and that had been developed. Um, so at the time, um, that connectivity, the, the, obje the objectives, um, potentially, it was a bit after the event. Um, but now it's really thriving and it's seen more traffic, I believe, than it has done in the past. Well, so it's, not, it's not as if the bridge is in the wrong place, where else would it be? <laughs> it, but it is uh, almost as if the motorway system is in the wrong place, isn't it? In, well, in terms of the, um, there are motorways and dual carriageways going east-west along those right, banks, yeah. but non, none going north-south, as it were, connecting to the bridge. Yeah, well, I guess you can't, obviously, you can't get there without the bridge, can you? So I guess we do, we connect up to the coast. Um, and then for people commuting to Hull or in Yorkshire. Um, and, and I think a lot of freight transport as well, um, you know, from um, p and ferries, things like that, um, it's been really important. We, which is, I was just talking to Jane about the environment and the mm. harm that the car does to the environment. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe there's a, you know, there are plans for infrastructure projects like Boris Johnson mentioning a bridge to France. Mm. Uh, do you think that maybe a more environmentally friendly uh, mode of transport could f get, get itself uh, uh, either on that the old bridge or a new bridge, you know, train, electric powered something, something wind powered even maybe. Wow! As a, as a new <laughs> a new project to replace the dirty old cars and crossing the Humber. Well, um, I take a guess that there's probably proposals out there. Um, I don't know what they are, but um, I could see that happening in the future because I think it will probably go that way generally, won't it? So, yeah, maybe it's a little mm. bit visionary, and I don't mean that in a, in a complimentary <laughs> way. Uh, so it'll be about 18 months until we can mm. see the, the fruits of all your yeah. labours, of your research. Yeah. Uh, what, so what sort of time of year and, and which, whereabouts do you think those exhibitions will be? Well, the process will in, involve volunteers supporting the project who will um, work with us to do a lot of that research, which will be across sort of May, June, July time this year. And then we'll look at producing the exhibition and a digital archive um, as a result of that. And then the exhibition itself will, will be on tour um, summertime 2019 Charlotte, and will result you. in a small Thank festival. Thank you very much. Good. We'll come back to it closer to the time. Here's Jack with all the sports news.
We'll start with tennis and it's good news for Beverly-based star Kyle Edmund. The 23-year-old has replaced Andy Murray as British number one after moving above the Scot in the world rankings. Edmund is now ranked a career-high 24th in the world on the back of reaching the semi-finals of the Australian Open in January. He was born in Johannesburg, South Africa but grew up in East Yorkshire in the village of Ticton and started playing tennis in Hull. On to football now and Hull City are in action tonight as they take on Millwall at the KCOM Stadium. The Tigers are just three points above the relegation zone so tonight's game provides a good opportunity to pull further clear. They've been on a good run of late winning two of their last four league games so they'll hope to keep that form going. Tonight could mark the return of frontman Abel Hernandez who has been in full training with the rest of the squad. The 27 year old Uruguayan international has been on the sidelines since rupturing his Achilles back in August. And at the game, the club will be paying a special tribute to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Triple Trawler tragedy. A round of applause will take place during the 58th minute of the game, with Hull City calling on the fans to pay their respects. Representatives from the charity's stand and the Fisherman's Mission will also be presented with match shirts from the Chelsea FA Cup game. Kick-off at the KCOM Stadium is at 7.45 and I'll bring you full post-match reaction in Wednesday Sport. And finally, newly appointed Grimsby Town manager Michael Jolly has spoken about his desire to get to work in his new role. The 40-year-old succeeded former manager Russell Slade, who was sacked after just 10 months in charge at Blundell Park. And that's all for tonight's sport. Back to you in the studio. Thanks very much, Jack. I'm afraid that's all for tonight. Remember, it is Cycle to Work Week if you want to get fit and help the environment. And if you have a news story for us, then please visit our Facebook or Twitter pages. Details below me. Email news at estuary.tv or phone Grimsby 01472315553. Write to us at Nuns Corner, Lincolnshire, Grimsby. Until tomorrow, good evening.